What's up, YouTubers? Welcome to part two of squirt gun welding. <laughs> well, MIG welding anyways. So in this video, we're going to be tackling a ton of stuff. So if you haven't watched my intro video one, watch that first. So all of the terms and ideas and stuff are all defined and we have a better idea of our machines. And then come back and watch this. If you've already watched part one, awesome. This is part two. So we are going to be tackling our first welds, getting everything dialed in on thinner plate, eighth inch, so 3.2 millimeters, and we're going to go from there. So to start out, you guys should really make sure to clean all your material to bright and shiny metal, just like this. You don't want mill scale on it with MIG. MIG has very limited ability to weld through mill scale and have proper penetration, so it's something to be aware of. Now I'm going to move all of these out of the way. We don't need them right now. We're going to start with a very simple, humble, single piece of metal. And what we need to do is we need to perfect running short beads. Now in my stick welding how-to series, we focused a lot on just doing spot welds. We don't really need to do that with this because starting the arc is as simple as pulling the trigger. So we're not going to waste time doing spot welds, but we will do little inch and a quarter, inch and a half long welds start to finish on this. And once we perfect that, we'll move on. Now, I know you guys want to be doing lap welds and fillet welds, and that's fine. Until you can perfect this exercise, there's no need going to those because those are harder than this. If you can't do the easy, why will you be able to do the hard correctly? So let's focus on this. Let's go over to welder, fire it up, and get some settings. So right off the bat, because we're doing the MIG process, we do have C25 gas hooked up to our machine. Make sure that you do as well. Now we're working with eighth inch or 3.2 millimeter material. This machine's settings, and we're using 030 wire, is recommending 270 inches per minute for wire speed and 18 and a half. That is what we're going to start with and we will adjust from there. Now whatever your machine says for eighth inch material, that is where you need to start while you're watching this video or in the future when you get around to it. Go by the chart of your machine. Every machine's different. You have to have a starting point. So go by what your machine says. If you have dials that don't have an LCD display, that's great. Use the machine settings based on your chart. Our gas is turned on. We have plenty of gas in the tank. We're at 2400 PSI. Our flow rate, I'll back this off a little bit, drop it down closer to 30, 30 CFH. Now the needle didn't move because we didn't purge the hose, but that little bit will lower it slightly. You want to be around 30 CFH. 25 to 32 roughly for doing lower amp MIG, MIG work. Before you start, get in the habit, wipe your hood down. It'll help you see better. This thing's actually pretty clean compared to what it normally is, but hey, it'll help you out. Alrighty, so we got our metal here. It's been cleaned to bright, shiny metal. Get in the habit of doing that. You don't want to be welding on mill scale. MIG does not like mill scale. The penetration tends to suffer. Now I did not clean this tip from my previous video. Imagine that. That's a half a point off of my grade. When you weld with MIG, you want to get in the habit of Clipping that tip off so you got nice clean wire. Don't start with that crap on there. It's going to give you a rough start and a rough start to your weld. Most of that in there won't really affect it, that debris and spatter, but get in the habit of cleaning it. So what I'll do is on this eighth inch 3.2 millimeter plate, I'm gonna end up dragging the puddle because I can't put my head where the camera is because you won't see anything. With MIG, you can drag and you can also push. I do either or, it really depends on the situation. With flux core, you can only pull or drag. You cannot push flux core in a flat position. 
So let's start and I'll run a little bead here. So based on how red that was for the length of time, it's probably decently hot. You can see it's a little humped up on the plate. The weld itself seems to be, I would say a little bit too big for this thickness of material. Now granted, we're only doing beads on plate. So when welding, say a fillet weld, that might be correct for this, but for the sake of beads on plate, it's a little bit big of a weld. Now, if you notice, in a case of this thinner material, I started three quarters of an inch off the edge. The reason for that is that if I would have started right on the edge, the settings we have would have been far, way, way too hot for this, far too hot. So by starting a little bit in, allowed us to get a more accurate representation of how these settings will weld on this thickness of material. And that's something to be aware of. The closer you get to an edge, like you notice, cold, warmer, hot. The reason that got hotter is because there's nowhere for the heat to escape in that area. So it gets superheated. And then you also will have the start of melt through near the end. I was able to control that with my travel speed fairly well to not blow off the edge of that plate, but we're very close. So I really think that these settings are a little bit on the hot side for this particular plate for just beads on plate. If we were doing a lap weld like this, I think they would be appropriate. Or a fillet weld, we, we would be more appropriate with these settings. Now I'm gonna cool this in a bucket of water and that facilitates getting this practice done faster. The thing is though, you do not want to dunk any critical work or anything that you're actually welding that needs to have strong welds. When that red hot weld gets quenched fast, the grain structure in it becomes rather poor and its tensile strength and elongation may go out the window. So don't quench anything that matters. For practice, it will help you get far more practice done. And right now it's already almost cool enough not to touch with gloves. So what I'm gonna do now, we're gonna drop the settings. I'm gonna go back to say 18.2 volts and 260 inches per minute of wire. If you happen to have a Hobart machine or any kind of like transformer that doesn't have a digital readout, rather than dropping your, your voltage tap, just lower your wire feed a pinch. So just a little bit. Stick out wise, this is the only time I'm going to mention this in this video, and it's very critical. You want from your contact tip to the molten puddle about three eighths of an inch, which is not much. That's at about a quarter, but it is recessed slightly in a tip. And when I start welding, I'm going to hold this a little bit off, okay? So that's what you want. You do not want to run along stick out. So our settings seem to have reduced the heat slightly. It's still roped up. It was a little bit easier for me to control it. Now at the start, I got moving a little bit faster than I should have, which did also help lead to the more roped upness of the weld. Now this particular welder has run-in speed adjustment, which is how fast it feeds the wire at the start of a weld. By tweaking that, I can change the start of this to where it's a little bit flatter and wet it out better. Or you could go the opposite and have it more humped up if it's too hot. Let me cool this down and we'll run another weld. So what I'm gonna do now, I like the way that looks. I'm gonna just take my time and go a little bit slower at the start to try and get it to wet out and be a little bit more equal. So if you look at that, you notice how I didn't change any settings. Just by going a little slower at the start, fixed that 
where it was narrow here. It's still a little bit humped up as you can see, but that's not looking too bad. We are running beads on plate here. I will say for right now that's acceptable. When you can get to a point where you have a very consistent bead like this, you are in good shape and you're ready to move on to the next exercise. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start playing with settings as should you to see what we can do to make this weld flatter. Now I have a great video out called heat to metal ratio. I'm gonna link it in the description. You must watch that video, even though it's flux core that I'm talking about in the video, it's still completely relevant to MIG process. You need to understand your heat to metal ratio to be able to dial in MIG and flux core. So what we're gonna do here to learn a little bit more about that is we're gonna take and we're gonna modify one setting. So we can modify either the voltage or we can modify the wire feed speed. Based on what I'm seeing here, I think our weld is a little bit on the large size for this material for running beads on plate. The heat level seems to be appropriate. We're gonna lower the wire feed and see if we can't deposit a little bit smaller, hotter weld. So I'm gonna go from 18.2 volts, 260 inch per minute for the wire, down to 235 for the wire. So it looks very similar to these other ones. If we look at the side profile, it's about the same. So what I'm gonna do now, we didn't see much of a change. We're gonna lower the wire feed down to about 210 inches per minute. All right, lowered the wire feed, kept the voltage the same. It's starting to flatten out near the end, but we're not depositing much metal, okay? The starts are all about the same. If you look at the end here, it's starting to flatten out, which is to be expected. Now, if your ratio of voltage to wire feed is far too out of uh, what we'll call the golden ratio, which is really a pretty wide range, you can start having issues with the wire burning back to the tip, excessive spatter, and so on. And what I'll do now, I'm gonna lower the wire feed down way low. We're gonna to go to like 170 and we're gonna take a look at it. We're starting to get a fair amount of spatter in there. The weld just isn't really wetting out that well. I mean, it is flattening out, but you can see how narrow it's getting. And you probably heard it didn't sound right, okay? So based on that, we're at like the absolute lowest wire feed you'd really wanna run for this wire. It's still making a weld, but our penetration on the inside isn't gonna be there. And it's just excessive spatter and so on. So that's not good. We're gonna go back and put the wire feed at 290. So way up from where we're at. Again, same voltage, 18.2, and we're gonna see what happens. So we deposited a wider weld. It's not significantly wider. It's a little bit flatter than these colder ones, but overall, Again, by controlling travel speed, I was able to make all of these settings for wire feed make somewhat okay welds. Just by appearance, this, it definitely sounded better and it looks better than this humped up previous one, okay? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start 
running a couple more beads. I'm going to bump the wire feed up even higher. We're going to go to 310 and see what happens there. So without question, that weld is starting to get much bigger. If we look two welds back, I would say it's about 30% taller and maybe 10% wider than this two away. So we're definitely depositing more metal. But if you notice, it's starting to rope up quite a bit. And that's because what we're doing is the penetration is staying the same for the most part. And when we increase wire, it's just piling up top on the plate more than it is driving in. So based on what I see here, we can run a huge variable of wire speed. And I know to you on the camera, these probably don't look that significantly different. And that has a lot to do with how I'm adjusting my travel speed to get the weld pool to the size that I want it. So my consistency in what I'm seeing and then what I'm doing is allowing for these to stay cl somewhat close. But most of these simply aren't right. I mean, if you were to try and weld two plates together, like with these settings, you're going to have a whole lot of weld that isn't wetted in. So what we're going to do now is take another plate and we're going to start looking at changes in voltage at a fixed wire feed and see what that does. Since I didn't clean this out yesterday, I'm going to do it now. If you get enough of that crap in there, what's going to end up happening is your gas shielding is going to like come out one side of this and it's not going to protect properly, so you don't want that. They do make nozzle dip for this, sometimes called cooter tip or cooter dip, something like that. Pretty funny name if you ask me. Welders have a great sense of humor sometimes. So we got a clean tip, never weld with a dirty tip, buddy. I got the settings at 18.2260. So we're just going to run a baseline just as we did there. And then we're going to adjust and look at the differences. So this is our baseline weld. You can see our heat affected zone very straight. That's what you want to see. We have no penetration out the back, which based on our settings, I wouldn't have expected. Our bead is a little bit humped up. Not too bad, but we're looking okay. So based on what I'm seeing here, let's go up to 18.6 volts and see what effect it has on the weld. It might be a little bit hard for you to see, but it's slightly less roped up. So it's a little bit flatter and it's a little bit wider, slightly. Now the end, it's getting much hotter. You can see it's starting to chew away at that plate. And it might be a little bit difficult to see, but the melt through or bite seems to be getting a little bit better because it's actually pulling this plate a little bit and leaving a noticeable ridge that I can feel. Like over here, hopefully don't burn my finger, there's a little ridge there where the weld is. It's much more pronounced in here. So we inputted more heat, flatten the weld out. Yeah, you can see it pretty good right here. It's starting to flatten out more. Let's run another weld, 18.8 uh, volts, same 260 inch per minute wire feed. All right, let's look at the end. It'll make it be far more visible. See how humped up this is? And then you look at the increase in voltage 
and then this guy is starting to get real flat as well. This I just didn't taper off, or I tapered off too soon, but we're starting to really flatten it out. I mean, the difference between these two isn't huge, but the difference between this guy and this guy by increasing voltage, fairly significant. And that's what you're gonna find. Small voltage changes, like two tenths or 0.2 of a volt, not huge, but when you talk a half a volt almost, big difference. So let's go back up to even higher voltage. Let's do 19.2 and see what happens. So when we look here, it's starting to get even flatter. The side profile says a lot. So this is flatter overall. Definitely from the first two, it's significantly flatter. Now, again, I'm able to compensate with my travel speed. Now, the beginning of that, my hood was auto darkening on and off due to the camera. So I botched that totally my fault on it. I actually hit the table and then tried to weld over it. So the start's my fault. We're starting to see some melt through before we get to the edge, which is a good indication that our heat input is definitely increasing. Again, it's very subtle, but everyone is getting flatter. Now, why don't we go up to 19.6 and do a final one for this and just look at where we're at. So I was successful in making a weld, but you can see how it's starting to get flatter. The molten puddle is starting to lengthen significantly. Like you can actually see, and let me get a pointer here. The molten puddle size is shown kind of in this area, okay? You can see it's starting to lengthen here. This edge is the edge of the molten puddle. Basically, when I let go of the trigger where the molten puddle was, well, look how big this molten puddle is. We're starting to get undesirable things like your crater way back here, and it's just staying too hot, too long. However, it did make an overall acceptable weld. You can see the toes of the weld. Let me get my pointer here. See how this kind of just comes straight up and then over? Notice how this kind of flows up more gradual rather than just straight up, and the shadow line will kind of tell you that. Like, this is a good example. See how you, like, don't see any shadow here? And then when you get over here, start seeing shadows, that's because of how steep that is. So increasing the voltage for your wire feed will flatten the weld out and make the toes a little bit better wetted in. But again, these settings, I mean, they work, but it's a little bit on the hot side, okay? Now we don't have any penetration clip through there, but there's quite a big crease right here, far more than these, and you can't really see that. But from the heat input, we also see that the line is a fair ways out here as well, despite this plate being cold when I welded on it. And again, this shows a couple things, and that's if your travel speed, if you can control it based on what you see with the molten pool, you can do, you know, you can make bad settings work. But my travel speed, I felt like I had to go real fast on this because it was running real hot. So, you know, the more skilled you are on controlling your travel speed and watching that molten puddle will give you more leeway. If I was less skilled with that, the results would be far greater in difference than what we see here. Now, with that done, we're gonna start on the next exercise, which is to pad beads on plate. I just wanted to throw this picture in here where you can see the differences as the voltage increased. This is really easy to see that. Clearly, the more voltage, the flatter the weld gets. 
So I got my plate set up here that we just did this, and what I'm going to do is run bead on bead on bead all the way out down this whole plate. I know this is tedious, but if you want to learn to be a good MIG welder, you have to be able to stack a bead on a bead. We've only done kind of what I would consider stringer beads, varying voltage to get slight subtle differences. So we're learning a little bit about the heat to metal ratio that I've talked about, but now's the time to progress from this. I mean, our beads are looking good enough. There's no reason why we can't overlay them really nice. The goal is, is to not have a peak in a valley. Like if you look at where we're at now, this would be an extreme peak in a valley. We have a weld here, a valley here, weld peak here, valley here. We wanna stack them on top of one another to where it layers flat. Now, the best way to do that is to aim the wire right at the toe line of this weld. So this, the toe of the weld is right here. We wanna run it right there. And we're gonna do the whole plate out and I'm gonna have arc footage of the whole thing, hopefully, so that we can see, or you can see, what I'm doing and what it looks like. We're gonna keep the same settings that the machine kind of recommends, which is 18.6 voltage, 260 for wire feed, and we're just gonna stick with the same thing, and I'm gonna cool the plate after every pass. I'm gonna let the video play. There's at least five arc shots here. This one is a little bit off camera, but that's all right. Pay attention to the molten pool and how long it is and how I'm just slowly dragging it along. It's a little difficult to see me overlapping everything, but you'll see it in the finished weld. All right, let's watch it. Here I'm going to push and my travel speed slowed down quite a bit. I couldn't see what I was doing with the camera in the way. And you can see how much wider that weld pool is. All right, shut the welder off temporarily just so you can hear me a little better. So I ended up running a ton of beads here. These I ended up pull angle. These I ended up pushing. And you can see the profile of the beads are a little bit different. My, now granted my travel speed changed a little bit and when I was pushing them towards the camera, I literally couldn't really see what I was doing. So my travel speed probably slowed down a little bit too much. But either way, you can push or pull them. Yeah, I would definitely say my travel speed must have slowed down and deposited more metal. But all of these are pretty decent. I would have liked to have overlapped these a little bit more. And that's what you should focus on. Now, when you look down this, see if I can get that to focus. You see how the peak and valley isn't too much of a difference. Like when you look at these, same thing up here. That's what you want. If your peak and valleys look something like these, you need to simply overlap them more. And hopefully you saw in that arc footage where my wire was being positioned in order to weld on this. I was essentially positioning it right here on the tow line. Now, like I said, these, by the look of it, I think I was a little bit further away than the tow line. And that's simply because I couldn't see, you know, where I was going. And that's the good thing about MIG over flux core. Flux core, you have to drag it so you can run into 
hard situations where you end up going like on an inside corner like this, you end up going straight in. And of course, that's always the time that you're going to wind up with porosity is the hardest place to clean it out. So it's kind of difficult sometimes with flux core. Well, with MIG, because you're relying on gas shielding and not flux turning into shielding gas, you can weld inside corners with a lot more success as well as push and pull. And like I said in, earlier in the video, I generally push with MIG depending on what I'm doing. I will occasionally pull. I really honestly don't do that much MIG welding in the last, I don't know, four or five years. I've done a few hours worth of it. And I mean, by far, I have the least amount of MIG experience of all the welding processes. I actually have more oxyacetylene welding under my belt than MIG. And this kind of gives proof that you don't necessarily need to do a lot of MIG welding to be okay at it. And that's because, well, I do do a lot of flux core wire welding, which is virtually the same thing when it comes to what you're looking for. So it's not really that big of a stretch to go to MIG if you can flux core wire weld. Well, I think this is pretty much cashed out. Ideally, for you at home, you want to do a couple plates like this where it's padded all the way out. You want to not have a really cold start if you can help it. You don't want to blow out the edge of the plate. You want consistency and do the whole plate out. And you really want to dial this in and it wouldn't even hurt to do it. Once you can do it like this, go on a plate like this and run stringers the whole length, okay? It really wouldn't hurt you. If you can fill up this whole plate with stringers just that look just like this, this whole plate end to end, flip it over, do this side, which this is just scrap so it already has some welds. By time you fill up this whole plate and it looks at least halfway decent like this, both sides, you're in good shape. And when you go to like fillet welds and other actual hands-on welds, you'll be doing real good then. Now I thought to end this video, I'm going to do a three weld example where I'm going to use settings that the machine says are for much thinner material than this, settings that are correct for this, and then settings that are way too hot. And we're going to look at all of them in arc footage, compare the differences, and talk about that. So let's do that now. Give me a thumbs up if you like the arc footage. I know I did. So I thought I would do something similar to what I did earlier, where I ran the same wire feed, 270 inches per minute for all three welds. The middle one, so the first one that I did was at 18.5 volts. The second one I did, which is this one, much colder at 15.5 volts, so far too low. And then the third one, the final one, I ran at 20 volts. And now in the art footage, you saw significant differences in how the welds looked as I was welding. And then in person, you can see the drastic change. We weren't adding more or less wire feeds, so the same amount of metal, but due to a change in the voltage, AKA the heat, we were able to flatten the weld out. Keep in mind, partially, the reason behind the weld flattening is that my travel speed was able to pick up. So by moving faster, I deposited slightly less metal, but the heat also helped widen the weld as well as flatten it out. And I thought that my demonstrations early, earlier just flat out didn't show the difference I was looking to show you guys and you can clearly see it. I mean, there's no mistaking that. The interesting thing 
I want to show you and use this as a measuring guide. If you look at this weld that's all humped up on there that it took longer because I was trying to get it to wet to the plate, but you can see it's a bead of caulk on plate, right? Look at the heat affected zone on that. It's wider than this player is, is right? It's very wide. This run at much higher voltage is literally smaller. What that tells you is the amount of heat that was inputted into this, despite being run significantly hotter, is actually less heat into it than running improper settings. And it really drives home the point of dialing your welder in, and that comes with experience and, of course, practice. But running it cold, if your beads are looking like that, no good. Either drop your wire feed significantly or bump up your voltage. Oops, sorry about that. Steady it. Yeah. Now, on eighth inch material, this weld is getting to the point to where it's almost too big, but it's acceptable. I mean, the amount of metal is acceptable on all three. It's just, if, we, if I did a cut and etch on this plate, you would see that this bead right here has zero penetration. And that's the one thing I don't like about MIG, and honestly why I don't do that much of it, is that when you're welding thick plate, it's very hit or miss whether or not you can get penetration. I mean, even on a weld that looks like this, that it's flowed out, on quarter inch plate, man, you weld over mill scale or rust, even though the weld looks like this, it may not have bit in. Hard to say on that. But yeah, let's go to the conclusion. Well guys, what did we learn today? <laughs> I learned, make sure you have your camera set up correctly because it took three attempts to get the arc footage to turn out on that last bit of them. But <laughs> beyond that, really, to be good at MIG welding, you have to do the basics. You guys out there, you guys and girls need to sit down and start running short little welds. And when you can perfect them, start overlapping them. Pay attention to everything that the metal and the welds are telling you. And you must practice. When you get really good and can fill a whole plate up like with short little welds like this and they're looking just like this, edge ends aren't blown off, starts aren't super cold, all of that, move yourself over to a plate like this and then fill it up end to end both sides. And then when you're looking real clean, everything's solid, then you can move on to doing actual welds. If you have skipped over this part and just try and do, you know, lap welds or fillet welds or outside corner joints, whatever have you, and you haven't mastered this, you're going to burn through, you know, hundreds of dollars of metal trying to get good. I mean, this little strip here is like 50 cents or a buck or something. You know, you can get a lot of practice out of something this simple and doing welds, actual test welds, you know, fillets and stuff when you're, you can't even do this. I mean, every shot is two bucks. You do 20 of them. That's 20 bucks, 40 bucks in the ballpark of that versus you could have done more practice and dialed it in far better for a couple bucks on these strips. So keep that in mind. But yeah, beyond that, we learned that settings matter and your heat to metal ratio matters. And I can't stress enough to you guys that you should watch the video I have linked in the description about heat to metal because you need to understand that in order to understand MIG welding. If you don't understand heat to metal, you will never be able to dial in your welds. It's very simple once you get it, and it will help you be a drastically better welder, especially at the start. But yeah, with that said, my next video in this series is going to be uh, dealing with actual welding joints, where we're going to talk about how to do it, how to approach it, how to set your settings, and we're going to be fooling around with possibly... Uh, thicker or thinner material as well. So we're going to get into tons of stuff. I got a lot of videos coming. So with that said, thanks for sticking around. Hopefully you guys learned something. Till next time.